sex, and it violated federal and state antitrust laws. But we soon discerned the bullion banks were working closely with the U.S. Treasury Department and Federal Reserve in a gold cartel, part of a broad scheme of manipulation of the currency, precious metals, and bond markets. As an executive at Goldman Sachs in London, Robert Rubin developed an idea to borrow gold from central banks at middle, minimal interest rates, around 1%. Sell the bullion for cash and use the cash to fund Goldman Sachs operations. Rubin was confident central banks would control the, pr the gold price with ever more leasing or outright sales of their gold reserves, and that consequently that borrowed gold could be bought back without difficulty. This was the beginning of the gold carry trade. When Rubin became U.S. Secretary, he made a government policy to surreptitiously operate an identical gold carry trade, but on a much larger scale. This became the principal, principal mechanism of what was called the strong dollar policy. Subsequent Treasury secretaries have repeated a commitment to a strong dollar, suggesting they were continuing to feed official gold into the market more or less clandestinely to support the dollar and suppress interest rates and precious metals prices. Lawrence Summers, who followed Rubin as Treasury Secretary, was an expert in gold's influence on financial markets. Pre previously, as a professor at Harvard University, Summers co-authored an ac academic study titled Gibson's Paradox and the Gold Standards, which concluded that in a free market, gold prices move inversely to real interest rates. And conversely, if gold prices are fixed, then interest rates can be maintained at lower levels than would be the case in a free market. Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan understood Summers' research when he remarked that in 1990. Meeting, three meeting at the Fed Open Market Committee, quote, I was raising the question on the side with Governor Mullins of what would happen if the Treasury sold a little gold in the market. That's an interesting question here because if the gold price broke in that context, the thermometer would not just be a measuring tool. It would basically affect the underlying psychology. President Obama has called for greater transparency in both the federal government and financial markets. In pursuit of such transparency, God has made Freedom of, Informa Freedom of Information Act requests to the Fed and Treasury Department for a candid accounting of their involvement in the gold market. In reply to Goddard's lawyers dated September 17, 2009, Fed Governor Kevin M. Warts acknowledged that the Fed has gold swap agreements with foreign banks, but insisted that such documents remain secret. As a result, last December, God has sued the Federal Reserve and U.S. District Court seeking access to the Fed's withheld record of gold swaps. Understanding the manipulation of the price of gold is profoundly important to all markets in the American public. On January 31, 2008, God placed a $264,000 ad in the Wall Street Journal. God has had warned, this manipulation has been a primary ca cause of the catastrophic excesses in the markets that now threaten the whole world. What God has warned against has come to pass. God has long implicated the COMEX as being a mechanism by which gold and silver price suppression is implemented. The smoking gun is the excessive concentration of bullion bank positions. This concentration enables market manipulation, just as market manipulation was a justification offered by the CFTC in 1980 when it acts against the Hunt brothers for manipulating the silver market. The weekly commitment of trader report documents the total net short position of commercial traders in the commodities markets. The monthly bank participation reports disclose the holding of U.S. banks in various markets. In a letter to God dated February 19, 2010, Laura Gardy, a CFTC legal assistant wrote, quote, the commission determined where the number of banks in each reporting category is particularly small, fewer than four banks, there exists the potential to extrapolate both the identity of individual banks and the bank's position. As a result, as of December 2009, the CFTC no longer disclosed the number of banks when it's less than four. The CST, CFTC has been investigating possible manipulation of the silver market for more than a year, so this report change is disturbing. The CFTC's own reports of November 2009 show that just two banks held 43 percent of the commercial net short position in gold and 68 percent of the commercial net short position in silver. In gold, these two banks were short 123,000 contracts, but long only 523 contracts. And in silver, they were short 41,000 contracts and long over long only 1,400 contracts. How improbable is that these two banks attract most of the investors who want to sell short? It has been possible to extrapolate the two banks that hold these large manipulative short positions in the COMEX are J.P. Morgan Chase and HSBC because of their huge positions in the OTC derivatives market, whose regulator, the U.S. Office of the Control of the Currency, does not provide anonymity when it publishes market data. In the first quarter of 2009 OCC derivatives report, J.P. Morgan Chase and HSBC held more than 95% of the gold and precious metal derivatives of all U.S. banks with a combined notional value of $120 billion. This concentration dwarfs the concentration in the gold and silver futures market and shows great, great 
great concern about the position of an issue. God has evidence there are huge physical short positions in the gold market that cannot be covered. Growing stress caused by burgeoning physical demand is threatening to lead to a price explosion, which restored the markets, the balance that regulations failed to maintain. In our view, the COMEX paper market will become you can dysfunctional. You just try to sum, finish with, up. We're finishing up. With force majeure having to be declared as the country shorts are unable to deliver on their obligations. We urge the CFCC to report fully and candidly on these markets and take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all, all of our panelists and um, uh, um, uh, uh, if I, I'll just start with a question that I sort of asked the earlier panel too, but I, I don't know whether Mr. Norris or anybody could uh, have from their research. Just what, one of the issues, it, it's, it's maybe a little bit more in the silver market, but uh, in, in these other precious metals markets, is the concentration of these markets is more than the concentration, let's say, in the energy markets that we explored last, last year. And just to help us understand that concentration and how that affects the fair and orderly markets. That, uh, um, because uh, I agree with an earlier panelist that this commission is not a commission to set prices. It's not a price agency in any way. It's, it's our main mission is to make sure that these price discovery markets are free of fraud and manipulation and that they're open and, and fair. But, but I'm curious what you 